we focused our discussion on muscle invasive bladder cancer and metastatic disease, but there's another world of bladder cancer and that's superficial disease. Uh, it is one of the most prevalent tumors uh, in the world and of course this has an important impact on medical care as well as medical economics. So Dean, what are some of the uh, trials that are being designed to look at superficial disease? What are some of the standards of care that, that we use for treatments of patients in the setting? So, so let's break it down in sort of simplistic terms, you know, uh, and, and it's, we now look at superficial disease, termed the non-muscle invasive uh, disease uh, category, and they range from patients who have TA low-grade tumors, which are predominantly a nuisance and do not threaten the life of the individual, uh, but the, again, it, it requires re repetitive TURs, resection, et cetera, uh, very costly in terms of, of management right up to uh, T1 and, and uh, plus carcinoma in situ, which can be a life-threatening high-grade disease, um, which uh, requires aggressive management and, in, and at times requires cystectomy to manage the patient's disease. So uh, in that, if we take a look at the treatments that have been developed for patients who have high-grade disease, it's predominantly been BCG, uh, uh, which is a, a standard of care um, approved for, for carcinoma in situ, multiple large-scale studies uh, uh, showing its, its value. Uh, and then uh, some studies uh, looking at uh, uh, patients whose disease have pro has progressed on BCG, looking at interferon plus BCG or looking at uh, intravesical chemotherapy, which historically have not been as active as, as BCG. Right. This is an area of intense interest in the sense that one is we have to like, take a look at the biology. Is the biology of these diseases similar to what we're seeing in muscle invasive and metastatic disease? Uh, and it may be in terms of certain uh, mutations, for example, P53 or, or other mutations. But then secondarily, BCG is an immunotherapy. And, and it's been exploited as an immunotherapy. And we know that it's a, an immunoresponsive uh, disease. And so we need to take a look as well as if we're identifying new drugs that are active in the in, in terms of immunotherapeutics in the advanced disease setting, it's really important to bring it into the earlier disease setting, which actually is a very large number of patients. And so toward this end, there are, there are studies that are being designed. That in fact, at the NCI, uh, this year is a meeting bringing people from all across the country. All of you are, or both of you are involved in that, in, in that uh, meeting. And, and it's really unique. What is happening is urologists who treat, who treat non-muscle invasive disease, scientists who are dealing with uh, sequencing and, and targeted therapy, uh, immunotherapy, not just in, in bladder cancer, but in melanoma and other diseases, um, and, uh, and including the NCI and the FDA, are all converging to see what can we do to develop uh, studies that would allow us to explore new treatments in this space, which hasn't seen a new drug in 40 years. And that's really important for us. So those trials will be emerging shortly, uh, and hopefully, uh, you know, we'll, we'll we'll be able to take those into the urology clinics. No, I think Dean, this is a very important point. And the point is, is that you know, bladder cancer really, urothelial carcinoma is really one of the most common cancers out there. It's like fifth or sixth most common. But medical oncologists actually don't see as much. Why? Because only about 20% of those patients have muscle invasive or advanced bladder cancer. So that being said and done, the vast majority of the patients are at non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. And all we have right now is BCG. It's a good immunotherapy, but we need more. And so I think this is a very fruitful area for testing. And certainly there have been other studies that have looked at some of the standard agents. Valrubus, if I remember correctly, is approved, is technically approved, but really nobody uses that drug in, in this disease. But gemcitabine has had activity. You were involved in some of the gemcitabine trials, the taxane trials that Jim McKiernan uh, and I did at Columbia a number of years ago. So th there have been investigations. What's, what has, I've been perplexed at is, is, is as oncologists, we've always combined things. We never did combination trials of intravesical therapy. And I think that's something that really does need to be uh, entertained. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, I'll just use gemcitabine as, as an example. When we did it, uh, you know, when we did the animal studies, we showed that you, the drug delivery is remarkable. Now, it, it depends on the molecular weight of the drug, and, but, the, but um, you know, for smaller molecular weight um, um, drugs, uh, you can really get great penetration. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum is that urology has always treated non-muscle invasive disease with intravesical therapy, which is inducing 
BCG in immune, a systemic immune response. Now we're talking about some of these drugs that are going to be or, or potentially be administered systemically, which is completely different um, mindset. So I think that's why it's important that uh, when we look at trying to develop these, these studies, um, that we have input from people who are delivering these systemic drugs, uh, scientists who understand how they, how they work from our, our, our basic science colleagues, a urologists who are used to treating them, and in point of fact, know the nuances in terms of management that can influence the outcomes that we're going to measure. Um, and then I think uh, also it's important for the, you know, for the viewership to know, uh, even at the NCI meeting, we have people coming in from Europe because this is a, this is a worldwide problem. If you take a look at you know, the American and European um, uh, demographics, it's a huge number of patients with regard to, to bladder cancer. And so um, you know, for the Western developed countries, this is really incredibly important. And, and certainly there is precedent for looking at systemic agents in the situation. Years ago, there was a drug called bropyramine, which uh, was an oral in interferon inducer, and it did have activity, but unfortunately it caused cardiac toxicity. Uh, so it was not, uh, not moved forward. But, but I think this is going to be another exciting area uh, of development. Evan, comments? Yeah, I mean, I think it might be a great area to potentiate immune response in combination with BCG, but even beyond that, there are so many unmet needs there. Mm -hmm. Patients that become BCG refractory that relapse after BCG, what do we do with those people? We can do a lot of different things, and a lot of times those patients end up with cystectomy, but why, might we be able to cure more of those patients with some of our newer therapies that we're looking at? Um, T1G3, you alluded to that. You, know, you have invasion through the lamina propria, not through the muscularis propria, uh, but you have grade three disease. That is a huge dilemma. What do we do with those patients right now? Some people will take them straight to cystectomy. Some people will give BCG over and over again or give BCG once and upon relapse, then go to cystectomy. We don't know what to do with those patients. So it's a very fruitful area to do testing of novel agents. And obviously, since we're already using immunotherapies there, I think it makes sense to import some of the systemic immunotherapies that are active, namely the checkpoint inhibitors at this point in time, earlier. And I just think it's a large number of patients and a lot of unmet need. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and you know, the disease is not restricted to the bladder. You know, we have upper tract disease, and you can't really give BCG in the upper tract. Right. And so there, a systemic therapy um, would be extremely helpful, and therefore saving the patient's uh, you know, removal of the kidney. And, and, and I know I have patients who have had to have bilateral nephrectomies and go on to dialysis in this setting. Um, and that's the last thing we want. If we had a systemic treatment, it would be extremely helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Certainly, this has been a great discussion, and we've covered a lot of concepts, not only for muscle invasive bladder cancer, metastatic disease, but for the treatment of superficial bladder cancer. The future is bright. There are a lot of clinical trials that I think we all need to participate in or refer our patients for. And uh, certainly with all of these new drugs, we would like to make improvements both in our patients' quality of life and their survival. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Dr. Dean Bajoran and Dr. Evan Yu for a, a, not only a uh, intellectually stimulating conversation, but a fun conversation as well. And, and we hope you've enjoyed this and learned something from it.